so excited to be here tonight and see this book in print and celebrate with you all. So thank you, Annette. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank, special thanks to Harper Collins and Zondervan team for putting this together and hosting, hosting us tonight. Um, so I, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage um, our contributors tonight, our panelists. So I'd like to invite Kay Warren to the stage. Kay is the co-founder of Saddleback. She's the wife of Pastor Rick Warren, an author and Christian communicator and advocate for people struggling with mental illness. She and her husband live in Lake Forest, California. I'd also love to invite uh, Amy Grant to the stage. Uh, Amy is a Grammy award-winning singer and songwriter and has written many books. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband, Vince Gill, and their children. Uh, Natalie Grant. Uh, Natalie is a multi-dev award-winning Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter and the founder of Hope for Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating sex trafficking. And finally, Tracy and Scott Hamilton. Uh, Scott Hamilton is an Olympic gold medalist, network TV figure skating commentator and philanthropist, and Tracy is also a philanthropist and author. Together they live in Franklin, Tennessee with their four children. So please welcome our guests to the stage. I've had the pleasure of, of knowing and working with all of these folks for quite some time. So um, it's really fun to see everyone again up on this stage. Uh, we've worked in global health quite a bit over the years um, on eight, extreme poverty and HIV AIDS. So this is exciting to uh, start a new journey for maternal, newborn, and child health. So Kay, we are so excited you could be with us here tonight and join us. Um, for the Mother and Child Project, as Tom mentioned, uh, Kay wrote the foreword for the book, Choosing Joy for Mothers and Children. Uh, and this is so fitting since Kay has been at the front lines of global health issues for the church for the last decade, um, particularly in HIV AIDS and the intersection with women's health. So coupled with her concern for maternal and child health, her leadership um, is so important to convey the gravitas of these issues to the church across America. So Kay, please share with us um, some of your experience and expertise of women's health issues in Africa, perhaps specifically in Rwanda, uh, where Saddleback's doing so much good work um, implementing healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies uh, through the peace plan over the last decade or more. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I became a global citizen in 2002 when I picked up a magazine article and it had a story on AIDS in Africa. And as you may or may not have heard through the years, I didn't care at that moment. I, I didn't care. I didn't know anything. I, I wasn't aware. I, it didn't matter to me. I didn't know anyone who was HIV positive. I, I didn't know anything. But in that process, um, God grabbed my heart, and I, at the invitation of World Relief with Debbie Dortzbach, who was my first mentor, and um, who told me, taught me how to be with people who were ill and who were poor. And my question to her, what is the good news of the gospel when a woman is living homeless, dying under a tree? And Debbie taught me and showed me. She invited me to Mozambique. And so I went to Mozambique and then Malawi and South Africa and then ending up to 21 other countries around the world, South America, Africa, Asia, um, Central America. And in that process, what I noticed first were the women. It was the women whose lives impacted me the most because as a woman, their stories grabbed my heart. And at first, really, all I could see was the differences, how these women walked with, with uh, babies on their back. And, you know, I'm complaining about my big old purse that I have to carry around. Here were women carrying babies on their back and wood on their head and walking miles for water, walking miles for wood. And, and I saw the differences of women who were dying because they didn't have access to health care. I saw women who weren't getting an education. I saw women whose babies were dying way too early and too soon. At first, all I could see were the differences. And then the more I spent time with women in the rest of the world, I saw how alike we were. I saw that we wanted the very same things. We wanted our babies to grow up healthy. We wanted to know when we were going to have our children. We, these women, as I did, they wanted an education. They wanted their families to be whole and intact. They wanted to be free of illness. They wanted access to health care. They didn't want to have to walk miles and miles for health care. They wanted the very same things that I wanted for myself, for my daughter, and for my grandchildren. 
And that began to unify us. And I came back and I said, our church has to do something. It wasn't enough for me just as an individual to care. I felt like our church had to be involved. And that has developed a conviction that we call the, the peace plan that every church, that it's not that every church, every faith community has to make a contribution to our own community, but to the globe, there's something to contribute. And through the peace plan, um, we began to work with Rwanda at the invitation of the Rwandan government, partnering with the government, partnering with the churches, have trained thousands of church leaders, have, this is the part I'm probably most excited about, trained about 4,000 volunteer community health workers who make thousands of home visits every year, who walk into the rural places where there is no access to medical care, bringing information about pregnancy, about gender violence, about spacing, about maternal health, about HIV, about basic health care. Everything that is needed for basic health care in a family is brought through these trained volunteer um, home health care, home health care, that's a tongue twister, home health care <laughs> workers. And, and through that process, lives have been saved. And it's been through the church. So our conviction that the faith community has something powerful to bring to any discussion about global health or, or global well-being um, has to involve the church. It's, it's a conviction of our hearts, and we believe there's something that the faith community can bring that nobody else can. Well put. Thank you. Uh, and before you pass it on, tell us a little bit about choosing joy for mothers and children. Tell us a bit why you, wanted, you chose to write the forward and participate with us today. Well, in all those years of, of visiting with mothers and, and becoming acquainted with their hearts, as, as I saw some of those mothers who became grieving mothers, who lost children, there was an empathy that I felt um, I could just try to project what it would be like to lose a child, and so there was um, a natural empathy and sympathy that I felt. But in 2013, when I became a grieving mother, when I lost a child, suddenly that empathy moved to very deep compassion. And that, that same heartfelt need and desire that I'd had for a decade, that mothers not lose their children unnecessarily. I didn't want any other mother to lose her child, whether that was because she got pregnant way too quickly, whether she had the timing was too, too spaced to, to closely together, and so then her baby might die, her baby was at risk. I didn't want any mother to lose any child for any reason. And so when I had the opportunity to speak into this and to lend my voice and say, we can do a better job for mothers and babies and children. We can do a better job. It came from a place of a shared, I shared the ache with grieving mothers around the world. I shared that longing to have your children whole and healthy. And what I want for me, I want for them. Thank you so much. So um, Amy and I had the honor of um, being with Melinda Gates. Um, when she visited Nashville last year, she came and did a couple of events, um, one at Belmont and one at, um, at the Hermitage. Um, and Amy moderated the event. Um, and it was an exciting day to learn about her passion for maternal and global health and how Melinda's faith has really fueled this passion for her issues and the broader mission of the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, that all lives have equal value. So Amy, that evening, you chose to grace us with a song, a cappella, Third World Woman. I won't ask you to sing it here tonight, but um, do share with us a little bit about the lyrics. Why did you write that song? And can you share with us um, perhaps a little bit about what that night meant to you? Sure, I, um, well, I was asked to moderate the evening, so I was sweating immediately. And like most people, I had heard a lot about Melinda Gates, but she was just kind of an icon. And anyway, I, I was so taken off guard meeting her, finding out that she liked to kayak and loved the solitude and that she got involved in this kind of work because of sightseeing, you know, and meeting people. And... I just loved what a natural transition it was for her um, to become engaged in this. Um, it made sense to me when I was 
in my really crazy, um, where I called them the sleep deprivation years, when my children were small and my career was skyrocketing. And my mother-in-law was actually living on the farm with uh, the man I was married to at the time. There'd been a lot of casualties to life, but. And I said, oh, I'm so tired all the time. I don't know. I don't even think I'm praying a prayer. I don't, I'm just functioning. And uh, this woman who grew up uh, at times homeless, had a fourth grade education, heart of gold. She said, you know, Amy, I think if you just pray one prayer every day, it's enough. And I said, well, what would that prayer be? And she said, I would just pray this. God, lead me today to those I need and to those that need me. Let something I do have eternal significance. And I got to tell you, I pump my gas differently. Because there'll be somebody on the other side pumping their gas, and I'll think, well, I wonder if they need me. Hmm. Even crazier, I wonder if I need them. Uh, and I got involved in, in all of this because, really, because I met Melinda. And I was just taken with her. And, uh, and I sang that night, not because I was trying to wow the crowd, but because I was so, I was so nervous I didn't know how to start. <laughs> and, uh, but in my imagining, um, you know, part of being a songwriter is picturing what it's like you know, songwriting is just storytelling with a little music behind it. And long before I met Melinda Gates, I had been captivated by people on the other side of the world. And so I sang, what if I were that mother? Stand from my TV. What if that were my brown-eyed baby? Hungry as she could be. What if that were my family? What if that was my world? Waiting on water, waiting on a vaccine, waiting on someone to bring me a bag of beans. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. What if I were that mother? And I was waiting on me. Big success, so well dressed on the other side of the sea. Living with my distractions, cause life's been good to me. Maybe she's praying, praying for a miracle. Maybe the answer is me. Love. Have mercy on me, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Ooh, oh, ooh, oh. Cause I was born in Georgia where I could do as I please. I can get my hands on just about anything I might need. But who's this third world woman? Who is she to me? Could be mother, could be daughter, could be sister to me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Ooh, uh -huh. Ooh, have mercy on me. So when I met Melinda, I felt like it was just the answer to the prayer I'd prayed that morning that my mother-in-law taught me. Lead me today to those I need. It's funny because the people that I've met here tonight, Yolanda and uh, Frank, I said, why did you come to this? <laughs> what made you show up? And uh, anyway, so.
I'm so glad to be part of this. I remember flying into LA when it was like just plunging into a dirt cloud. My friend Jennifer Cook grew up in Orange County and they would have days when they didn't go to public school because of the smog alert. They have to stay home, couldn't play outside. And you fly into LA now and it is beautiful. And you can see for miles and miles and miles. And when they first started putting catalytic converters on cars, everybody was like, right, like that'll make a difference in LA. And it did. And it took 30 years plus, but it did. And HIV AIDS, the same thing. It's not the issue it was. And I, I really believe that we can look back on this time in the history of our rural community and say the trajectory changed because we empowered women to have a voice and a choice, really. So, gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is a treat to be here tonight. Um, Natalie, do you want to sing as well? This <laughs> <laughs> woman can sing. <laughs> I know she can. I'll leave that to her. <laughs> So Natalie, Natalie and um, I've worked together on HIV AIDS as well around the one campaign. She has also been on the front lines of sex trafficking and modern day slavery uh, movement for the last decade. And um, she has her own nonprofit, as I mentioned, Hope for Justice in Nashville. So let's talk a little bit about your article, which is interesting because it's at the intersection of sex trafficking and healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies or family planning, uh, brothels, survival, and hope. Um, so in that, can you just share us a little bit, you know, you have such a powerful anecdote in that um, article, Natalie, about Inya, and just share your thoughts on how and why maybe contraception is an important issue for girls like Inya. Well, Inya um, is a story that I start my essay out with, and, um, you know, I learned about the horrors of sex trafficking because I was watching Law and Order. Um, I never thought Law and Order would change my life, but um, <laughs> it did. And but then I took a trip that I say wrecked me for life and wrecked me in in the best possible way. And um, a lot of that came through meeting a young woman named Enya. I met her when she was 20 years old. She'd been rescued. She was a victim of human trafficking, but she was being restored at um, the Hope Home there in Mumbai. And when I met Enya, um, she told me the story of how it happened for her. It was her 12th birthday, and she'd always dreamed of going to the big city of Mumbai. She lived in a village about four hours outside, and she had never seen the lights or the hubbub of a big city. She woke up the morning of her 12th birthday, and her parents surprised her with a trip. And they said, we're going to take you into the city on the train for your birthday. And so she rode the train with her mom and dad, and there was such a massive humanity as she was getting off the train, her hand slipped out of her dad's, and she got separated from her parents. And um, she told me that she, she was so afraid, she didn't know what to do. She didn't have like a cell phone in her backpack or something. She had absolutely no idea what to do next. And she thought as the crowd cleared, surely she would see her mom and dad frantically looking for her. And as the crowd cleared, there was no one looking for her. And she went over and sat down against a wall and began to cry. There was a man in a nice suit who came up to her and said, my wife and I will help you find your mom and dad. Um, let us get you some lunch first. And she didn't know what to do, so she went with the man. Um, only there was no lunch, and there was no finding her parents. Um, there was a cold room and a concrete floor where she was raped 27 times that day um, on her 12th birthday. She came to find out that her parents had sold her. And, you know, it's hard for us to imagine, those of us who have never experienced extreme poverty, it's very hard for us to imagine the decisions that we would make. And Enya's parents did not think they were selling her into sex trafficking. They thought they were selling her to be a domestic worker. They thought she would work in someone's home, and in exchange for that work, um, she would receive an education. And because of their extreme poverty, they were forced to make decisions that they otherwise would not have made. But because of that, their child was sold into sex trafficking. And in speaking with Enya, she said, we had, my parents had so many children. 
They just had so many children. They, they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford us. There were so many of us. And we have now learned that in many of the high-trafficked areas around the world, um, it's as a result of extreme poverty. And um, in Enya's case, she didn't even have, she didn't have a chance because her parents, they couldn't afford them. And they thought the best way to give her a shot at life, the best way to even get her an education was to sell her. And of course, she never got the education. And thank God she was rescued after she had been trafficked for seven years. Um, she was rescued and she was restored. And unfortunately, she passed away from AIDS at the age of 21. Um, but you know, after meeting this and, and going to Mumbai, my husband and I had the opportunity to tour a brothel. They let us in because they thought my husband was a potential customer. And we walked and we saw cubicle after cubicle after cubicle, some of them with a bed, some of them with just a mattress. But on one of the beds, there was a rope tied to the end of a bedpost. And we found out that the woman that was forced to work in that room had an 18-month-old child that she was forced to tether to the bed while she worked. There was no childcare, there was no daycare, there was no nanny that she had access to. No opportunities, so she was forced to tether her child to the bed while she serviced client after client after client. For me, this issue is hand in hand with maternal health and well-timed pregnancies. So many of these victims of human trafficking, they do not have access to quality, effective contraception. And because of that, these girls are having babies at the age of 13, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Many of them die as a result of being so young in childbirth. And I'm here to tell you, I saw it with my own eyes. They throw those children. A 13-year-old is still just a child. They throw those children out on the street. They have body sweepers that come through Mumbai and just pick up the bodies that are tossed out on the street from these brothels. But these girls need the opportunity. They need an education. Their parents need to be educated to know um, how tricky, what liars traffickers are. But more than that, they need education and access to quality contraception so that, as a result, um, these children can have a chance. They can have a chance and, and not be victims of their circumstances. Thank you so much. And thank you for writing that brave piece. Um, so, uh, Tracy and Scott come together tonight. Um, they live in Nashville, about seven minutes away from my house. Um, and over the past few years, it really has been a pleasure getting to know them um, and nurturing a fr friendship that really is rooted in a foundation of passion for global health issues. Um, and I'd love for them to share with share that with you tonight. So, so Tracy, um, in, your, in your piece, Speaking Up for Other Mothers, um, you share about your initial response to the Haiti earthquake in 2010 and your prayerful response. Will you share a bit about that with us now and just tell us how that has led to your work with Live Beyond? Uh, Kim Paisley also is a contributor of the book. She talks about Live Beyond as well. What have you learned about maternal and child health there at the clinic in Tomazel? And maybe could you share with us um, an anecdote about your own children? Sure. Thank you, Jenny. I just want to say um, I am so honored to be up here and inspired and moved by each one of your hearts and your stories and your work. And I'm a little emotional because I'm exhausted, but I'm, I'm, that, I'm just so honored and privileged. And to get to be a part of this is beyond words. So thank you. Um, the Lord really, really burdened my heart uh, for Haiti when the earthquake happened. And I, I've been moved before by watching natural disasters occur on TV, and um, I followed it, but, you know, Again, it was just God who burdened my heart in a different way and in a deeper way for Haiti. And um, I was desperate, literally desperate, to get there to help. I watched um, these mothers, you know, desperate to find their children, children without mothers and fathers on the streets. And they're already the, you know, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And then the earthquake happens, and it's just how, how much worse can it get? And it got a lot worse. 
So um, I was literally desperate to get there, and I, I prayed constantly, and I uh, continued to do research to find you know the best people to go with, and how should I go, and I prayed, and I prayed. And um, I wanted to do something right away, but a dear friend of ours said, you know, you need to just continue to pray about it and wait and see who's still there when the dust settles. And um, a dear friend introduced us to the Vanderpools, and um, we uh, ended up, I ended up going to Haiti for the first time a year and a half after the earthquake and started working with them. And um, they were there two days after the earthquake and were on the ground for about two months um, giving food and medical care. And they ended up um, setting up in Tomazo because it was the just poorest of the poor, a very rural area. And um, so when I went there and I, I saw these mothers with their children who were just barely making it, and the, you know, I'd see a, a four-year-old or, or a, a, excuse me, a two-year-old that weighs eight pounds, 10 pounds. And I put myself in this mother's shoes and I, you know, I, I go, this could be me, this could be my child, this could be, you know, my husband. And I, I had to do something. I just, I absolutely had to do something. And um, so we've just continued to go back and, um, and we've since seen the difference that um, just healthcare, simple healthcare and education for these mothers and just giving them different options than what they know. Um, so many of these mothers, they, they don't know that they have options. And um, so this work is, is life-changing and life-saving, and that's why I wanted to be such a part of it. Thank you, Tracy. Oh, and sorry, you mentioned, <laughs> sorry, honey. You mentioned um, our own children, and we've adopted two children from Haiti, a 13-year-old and 11-year-old, and they are direct results of, you know, a mother having five children way too close together, and the mother and father could not care for these children. Um, they have a 19-year-old, 17-year-old, 15-year-old, and our children, 13 and 11. And uh, their parents brought them to the orphanage when they were four and six years old. And they spent six and a half years in the orphanage um, before we brought them home. And you know, they are a direct result of that. They were not able to feed them. They were not able to care for them, to give them an education. and. Um, so, and, and they are also victims of the earthquake, but it, it's, it is real. It is real. So, uh, we mentioned the Nashville event with Melinda, and um, Scott moderated the event, uh, an interview between uh, Bill Frist and Melinda Gates at Belmont University um, that morning, and it really was just an amazing um, uh, combination of personalities that came together um, that day. So. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great trio at that event. Um, Scott, can you share with us a little bit about your experience and your own story of commitment to care for mothers and children in Haiti and around the world? Well, first and foremost, um, I'm her partner. And uh, whatever we get into, we get in together. And uh, this one um, it was very unexpected. Um, I'm an ice skater. Okay, I'm comfortable being the only guy on a DS with, you know, all women. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Haiti doesn't have ice rinks, you know. Uh, why we, uh, okay. I was working, it was 2010, so I was um, in that first quarter and I was working, I'm um, getting ready for the Olympics and, and all of that. And I talked to Tracy and she'd be in tears, she couldn't look away. And I knew that um, her heart was broken and knowing kind of um, just how life works from my own experiences, sometimes being broken is um, the best, best way for growth. And um, it resets your sensitivities and your, um, your views of life. And um, we, we talked about it, we prayed about it, and, and it was um, uh, truly uh, a, a gift for us to have the opportunity, 
or for me to have the opportunity to send her down the first time because she was so excited to finally get down the roll up her sleeves and get to work. And, and to, you know, to see her come back more alive than I've ever seen her, to see that part of her soul that was awakened by serving these people that have nothing, have very little chance, and to hear the stories of that community, Tomazo, shattered my heart. Um, one story um, that, that speaks of this subject is, um, I told it earlier and I'm not gonna get through it again, is a woman showed up at the gates of the orphanage where our children were living. And she had a baby that she could no longer feed. She had four other children and she, or she ran out of milk. She had no food. She, couldn't, she could not keep this baby alive. She fed this child mud just to stop it from crying. And she went to the orphanage and said, can you please take my child? I can't feed it. I have four other children and I can't do it. And um, the orphanage said, we're, we, we're over capacity. We can't take another child. They'll shut us down. We'll lose everything. We're so sorry. Um, so they just, the woman just, you know, left. And the next day, they found this baby next to the wall with a rock put through its head. The orphanage wasn't plan B. It was plan Z. She had no other place to go. She had no other thing to do. And she could not stand to watch this child suffer anymore. So being introduced to this movement, to this, this amazing concept and idea is, is a prayer answered. Because now there, there is a solution to a problem that exists around the world where these mothers have no chance and their children obviously have no chance. So our work in Haiti, I've been down many, many times. Um, the people there are amazing people, they're passionate, they're, they're happier than happier, they're sadder than sad, they don't spend any time in the middle. <laughs> they just don't. <laughs> and, and bringing these two children home um, it was one of the greatest gifts um, I've, I've ever received. Um, you know, surviving cancer, and um, I have a collection of life-threatening illness, which is a bad hobby, I don't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> um, but you know, going from two biological children against all odds with my health history to now um, having a different looking family. Um, it's, you know, a rainbow would not exist with one color. And we have a beautiful family. I look at these two children from Haiti and I see how far they've come. And I look into their eyes and they're gorgeous eyes. And to see them change shape from being kind of sad to being actually kind of thrilled about what's next. I mean, I get to do this, you know, and pretty soon they get kind of a little entitled, but we straighten them out. But <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. And to have a daughter for the first time, I mean, I might, you know, it's true what they say about fathers and daughters, you know, um, she wears my sons out, but she, she's got my heart forever. And, um, and to know that without our intervention, they would have no chance, no chance at all. They were about to age out of the orphanage, and then what? Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? How are they going to live? How are they going to feed themselves? What are they going to do for a job? There are none. The unemployment in Haiti is unbelievable. So bringing them home was really the only option we had. And, um, and it's hard. But, you know, hard stuff is the good stuff. Hard stuff lets you know who you are, what you're about, what you're made of. And, um, and I, I don't think life has ever been more full for us. And to know that uh, meeting Melinda and, and, and um, moderating that discussion was the first time I've ever done anything like that. I'm with Melinda Gates and Senator Frist. <laughs> I am Forrest Gump, okay? <laughs> It, it was, I learned a lot. I learned kind of where to put the cards when I was done with them. I didn't do that very well. <laughs> and just hearing them both speak, these, these world changers, and to know now that a lot of the concepts, a lot of these stories, a lot of, and you can hear the passion in every one of these speakers, a lot of these stories have now been documented where we all can 
appreciate them, where we all can be inspired by them, where we can all shed more than one tear, but know that our lives are a little bit richer and deeper because we have a better understanding and a compassion for people that truly cannot help themselves. So this is um, a fantastic project. Um, it's come to life today. To be a part of this presentation as the only guy, you know, is kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, I just really, um, I, I just thank uh, Melinda and uh, Senator Frist for uh, including us and allowing us to tell our story as a part of this um, collection of stories. And uh, I know you're all gonna be uh, touched, inspired, and moved by every word you read in these pages. It's a spectacular accomplishment. Thank you all. Thank you so much for sharing your hearts with us tonight. It was really a privilege to be here. Thank you for writing for the book. Thank you for your bravery to write for a book like this. Um, it means it means so much. And um, we have 42 other contributors as well, some of which are with us tonight. We'd love for you to meet them. So thank you, all of you, that were able to come tonight as well. Um, so what are next steps? How can you make a difference? Um, how can you, you guys take a stand for maternal, newborn, and child health and healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies for women and children in the developing world? So step one is buy the book. Of course. Um, hold a book, um, also by the discussion guide. We didn't mention that. We have a discussion guide with this, this book. It's a four-week um, program uh, for, for book clubs, for Bible studies, to promote awareness and education on these issues. Hold a conversation. Talk with your family and friends about this. Spread awareness. Um, step two, follow us on Twitter, HTHH Global. Follow us on Facebook. Start this conversation with your social networks. And step three, perhaps the most important, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, the true work of advocacy. Write, call, email your elected officials and let them know you care about these issues. Let them know that you want to take a stand to protect funding for U.S. programs in maternal, newborn, and child health and international family planning and foreign assistance. So join our faith-based coalition for healthy mothers and children worldwide at Hope Through Healing Hands. Be a part of this movement to change the lives of millions of mothers and children and families around the world.